Today, we're talking about all the beautiful forms of variegation that can occur in plants, both aquatic, like this Laganandrimi boldi with the sparkling and the white variegation, to pothos plants, which you can put in the back of your aquarium to suck up nitrates if you have the roots in the filter, to other plants that naturally are variegated and those plants created by the help of humans like some of these petite Anubias and uh, the various Pinto Anubias or this variegated Anubias which is actually a chimera, which we'll talk about in one moment. Enjoy. All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about variegation. So welcome to the secret history living in your aquarium. Uh, today we're gonna be looking a little bit outside the aquarium as well as in it, but we're gonna be talking about variegation, which means multicolored uh, vegetative growth on plants. So basically any plant that has color that is not inherently normal in the species. So if you had a rhododendron and the leaf had white veins on it, that would be variegation. If you have um, uh, hygrophila polysperma, which is a beautiful, you know, pink and green uh, aquatic plant, we'll show you that in a minute here, and it has white and pink veins on it, that is variegation. And there's a number of causes of this, and it's actually pretty controversial. So it's a bit of a story of how, well, how I came to learn about variegation, and that it means a lot more than just a type of plant, or a plant that was bred a certain way. A whole lot goes into it. Now, naturally variegation can occur and evolve into a plant and become a trait, uh, and it still gets termed as variegation when it's not really true variegation. It's really natural um, mutations that are then solidified because they are a positive attribute. Maybe it makes the plant look infested uh, with some sort of mite or fungi, and then other um, pests will not attack it, or maybe it brings attention to the plant uh, for a certain pollinator or something to be attracted to the general plant instead of just the flowering body uh, for short times of the year. But we're going to explore some of the controversy of variegation, and also we're going to talk a little bit about it. But basically what you need to know going into this is that it is a Latin term, uh, derived from a Latin term, what is variegatus, and it means multiple color, or having various colors. And uh, basically you can see it in a lot of our plants now. It's become very, very popular. And we're going to take a look at it, talk about where it comes from, talk about when it's real, or how people have been tricking the uh, rare plant market. Uh, into seeing variegation uh, or buying variegated plants that don't last. And we're going to talk about the types that pass on genetically versus the kinds that are just one in a million uh, mutations. And that's where the really rare plant uh, auctions and things, that's, that's where those generally occur. And you can see why that could be controversial if people are figuring out a way to spark this from, from, from uh, happening to, to cause it to happen when it is not truly going to either pass on or stay in the plant for longer than, say, a year or six months or however long it takes for that foliage to grow out. So let's take a look at some stuff and let's talk about the kind of crazy journey that has brought variegation into the hobby and into the houseplant hobby as well as the aquarium hobby uh, over the last, say, 40 or 50 years is really when it's popped up, but the last 10 years it's gone wild. So let's talk about all of that today on The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. 
All right, guys. So when we're talking about plants that are variegated, like we said, it just means multicolored. And humans can help by selecting. So in the wild, this uh, spider plant, or, you know, some people would call it by its Latin name, which is Chlorophyllum comosum, uh, give or take the pronunciation. But it would have something similar to this sort of dual color with the light in the center uh, coloration. But humans may have brought this sort of uh, trait out by selectively breeding the plants that show it the most. But this is natural. Uh, this is natural variegation or variegated plants. And I'll show you another form here. So natural variegation like you saw in that spider plant, also occurs in a lot of lilies. And it's just multiple colors and banding in the, in the veins of the lilies with speckles and whatnot. The same thing can occur in other plants too, like in this plant where it's been selected for, and you can kind of see it in the veins. This is Hygrophila uh, polysperma sunset. Uh, there's the white kind and the pink kind both growing in here, as well as the uh, red type right in the front here. And that's been selected for, but it's still just considered a natural mutation. And it's basically a lack of pigmentation in the veins of the plant. Uh, or it could just be that the, the thickness of the plant's cell tissue or the layer of vegetative tissue at the top is thinner there, and doesn't have the pigmentation of chlorophyll because if you look at other plants you can notice uh, something in common usually and that's that they're generally generally a green color greenish yellow dark green doesn't matter but that's because of chlorophyll which allows them to take the sun and turn it into food energy salt uh, and all the other minerals and things they get from the ground things like uh, the elemental stuff, and then all their sugars, which they turn into ATP, uh, which is kind of a universal cell energy, they get from the sun and from CO2, oxygen, nitrogen, which are elemental, obviously. Um, and they suck that up and they use the color to basically create as much energy as possible. So when they give up that color, they either are putting in chemicals into their body, just like we do when we get tan skin from a, so much sunlight, that they're protecting themselves, and that's usually an anthocyanin chemical or carotenoid, and then you see red colors in the plant. Sometimes they use iron or other, other uh, pigmentation to do that, gold even, um, in trace amounts, and it's just the way light refracts, but when you see the various colors in autumn that plants turn, pretty much anything in that palette that we get in our aquarium as well is just a way that it's reacting to the light or lack of light. And the green is usually going to be most pronounced in low light plants uh, that aren't getting much light. Or, I mean, even normal plants that need medium light, uh, but that are getting plenty of light Sometimes then they can also create these colors in excess because they don't need as much chlorophyll. And that's sometimes where we get these mutations from is they happen and it just gets rid of a layer of light on some part of the plant, uh, of the light green or whatnot. And then the light shines through and we can see what's going on underneath. So that form is a refractive form of natural light, just reflecting off the parts that don't have chloroform uh, or, chlor or chlor chlorophyll. Sorry, guys. <laughs> chloroform would knock you out. Some of these plants almost knock you out when you look at them. They're really pretty. But uh, when you see it in the, in the presentation that we see here, this is not natural. Even though that looks pretty similar, that is going to be that metallic color, that stardust. That's not naturally in this plant, the Loganandra meboldi silver powder or silver dust. This is an expensive plant because it is a selected form of the uh, variegation, but it's not so common, but it is a mutation that can happen in nature, and then that plant has to be either grafted or cloned or um, carefully 
uh, propagated from its tissue. Usually these traits don't pass on super well, or if they do, the plant can be unhealthy or unstable. So that's why you get a lot of grafting going on as well as tissue cultures or cuttings from a mother plant. But the silver that you see, that reflective color there in the plant, that's not that the chlorophyll is missing, it's that there is a layer of trapped either guanine or guarine crystals air or water in the cells depending on what plant it is or it could be that there are little cilia or hairs on the leaves that have actually turned a color and are refract refracting or reflecting light and when you see other colors in there like on this prayer plant um, you know, which is often seen in the houseplant trade. When you see the red, you see the light green, you see the dark green. Well, those two greens are naturally in the plant and, and kind of the color palette of this and the dark green and kind of a white color. But these grow in the, under, in the undergrowth of the forest and uh, they're found in the Brazilian rainforest. They actually close up at night. That's why they're called the prayer, prayer plant. The plant kind of uh, comes together, the leaves kind of fold together at night generally. But when you can see that color through it, I want to show you something. At the bottom here, this leaf that's way out of the light, there are actual variations of this plant in uh, human care that have that color down there. Now this plant, that leaf is just unhealthy. But to show you that the chlorophyll has drained out of that plant, it shows you that underneath that you either have carotenoids, which are the red, the red streaks that we see here, in those veins of the plant, or you've got something going on in the plant where you actually have um, xanthophylls, which is the yellow chemical or group of chemicals that you can see here in the plants. And that's why when trees, when the plants fall um, in the autumn, the leaves fall off and stuff, you usually see this. It's, it's just the plant drained of color. The chlorophyll has broken down and even the chlorophyll cells, uh, the little microcells, have gone back into the plant and used as energy. Um, and here you can also see that there is some of the secondary kind because so much human intervention has gone on in this plant. But you can actually make out these little uh, pockets or cells. You see the little striations or serrations there? Uh, that is actually the secondary kind uh, of the variegation, which is basically caused by um, being transparent, and that's why it's happening on the margins of where these colors meet. But those are actual cell walls that we're seeing causing that thumbnail or fingerprint look there. And this is still a within the natural realm it's not done artificially or genetically necessarily but to propagate this you need to take a cutting from this adult plant uh it flowering these traits won't necessarily pass on now it depends on the species and we can go over here and take a look at another colorful plant and there's a reason why you see these same palettes on plants and you see the yellow in the blotches where things aren't as healthy in this plant it actually occurs all along where the chlorophyll doesn't collect as deeply and that's why you see the yellow now even if a plant is not considered variegated and this is the same plant here this leaf and this leaf and even if a plant is not considered variegated you'll still see that red, yellow, green, and orange color set in so many plants because you're seeing the carotenoids and the uh, anthocyanins. Uh, deep red is usually an anthocyanin. Uh, and then there's the carotenoids, and there's things like lycopene and beta-carotene uh, that are in carrots, you know. Uh, you're probably familiar with that and why that's why carrots are orange. Um, and... It just so happens that it's in the leaves of these plants. So when you get the chlorophyll out of the way, or you get a mutation that causes the chlorophyll to be out of the way, you end up with plants you can see through that layer, and you can see the colors that usually don't come out except for in plants in the northern and southern hemispheres away from the equator that are seasonal and that drop their leaves or that uh, turn colors in autumn uh, wherever you may live on the planet. 
Now, in our aquarium hobby, this is a plant you may recognize. This is pothos, and this is a white form of pothos. You'll find forms that are yellow also, and this plant, I'm saying this one because this plant is actually three plants. We've got a golden pothos here that needs some probably some nitrates and some phosphorus, honestly, uh, from where it's at. But the leaves here, you can see that there's the white color, and that means that they're not photosynthesizing. And humans have selected this mutation to the point where sometimes it will take over an entire leaf. You'll actually lose all the color out of a leaf. Some of these leaves just have a pattern, and those patterns can be uh, passed on by cutting the plant and, and passing on sections of the plant. Um, but when you see a whole leaf that is a color like this golden one, it means that the chlorophyll is essentially out of there. And what causes this is chimera variegation. And that means that there's actually two plants here. And in the form of variegation that's happening here, there are still, um, th there's a plant in here that if you guys saw videos of it uh, about a year ago, you would know that there are still some leaves that are pretty solid in color. And uh, they, if they were not in the sun, they wouldn't have any of this. So right here, what we've got is sort of a pinto or variegated white color, as well as the golden pothos color. And uh, that has, is caused because there are actually two genetic bodies living in here. Two sets of DNA are in this plant. And I said this plant is special because there's actually green pothos, the original kind, which can photosynthesize most effectively. And then there's the yellow, which is, uh, you see those because of the, um, the color of the carotenoids and the, uh, the, um, the xanophils. And then you can also see uh, the white kind, which is a complete absence of that. Now there's a few other kinds of, of uh, this coloration that are caused by rarer things, but in most of the plants in our hobby are cuttings from kind of this same thing. And they're usually either rhizome plants that have um, something like Anubius in the aquarium, which we'll go look at again in a sec, or that have uh, bulbs, tubers, things like that, or vegetative growth like this, where you can just cut it and as long as it's watered, it will continue to grow. However, if the white takes up too much of the plant, it can no longer photosynthesize. So it's really important to over uh, feed these guys their nutrients. See, this leaf is almost completely white and we could be selecting for that if we were to cut there. So to care for this plant, if you start seeing too much white appearing on a limb or on a, a stem of the leaves, uh, with all the leaves on it that are too white, you want to cut that off. And the same goes for if you see too much green, if you're losing all your favorite leaves that have the different coloration or that have a pattern you want, so here's one that's pretty normal, then what you do is you cut off, you find where that's coming from, and you cut off as much of it as possible as you can. The plant will then redirect energy to what's still living, and it may try to sprout another green leaf, but uh, more than likely, it will put the energy into any of the leaves as long as they're not all white, and as long as you give it its proper fertilizer profile, which you can look up online and so forth, it will still continue to live. Now, the exact same thing is true when we talk about Anubius. Now this is a Pinto Anubius and some leaves are totally white. Now this couldn't happen unless the plant had totally green leaves too. When it is a totally white plant, you've probably seen that as a tissue culture, but it really can't survive because it can't photosynthesize. So unless you have it in a mix of nutrients that just perfectly mimics all the energy that the plant needs from the sun, it would be like keeping your plant in the dark. And so that's why it has to be in a plant that has genetically basically had two plants accidentally or by mutation occurring in the same plant at some point in its history. So that's a chimera kind and that's probably the most common type of uh, variegation that occurs other than just the natural evolved and selective variegation. But that is what you'll find in the hobby. But because of that, it grows slower and it needs more nutrients. So really look up your plant 
and then figure out what nutrients it needs and what lighting it needs and you really need to give it that times two or three at least and that will keep it growing. Now if you want to propagate this you also have to select it from the tissue that is the chimera or the half that is the white part. So you would need to select a part that's got the white part but if you did that you'd probably get that stark white leaf growing and they'd all grow white. So you want to find a leaf with this marbling and uh, or this kind where the veins still have some green in them and that means that there's still at least some chlorophyll being produced whereas some of these leaves this one here but by my index finger almost has none it would die that plant so if we did this we would probably want to cut it so it has some green and some of these leaves but due to how labor intensive that is and the time it takes and the nutrients and you can see this plant is prone to being um, getting holes from uh, nutrient deficiencies or just from animals picking on it because uh, it has spots of low nutrition and then the cells can die and then there can get, be holes in it but because of that they're more fragile all across the board house plants or aquarium plants and because of that they get very very expensive um, almost as expensive as the rare mutations like the Loganondra meboldi silver we looked at in the other aquarium now there are some really beautiful versions of uh, variegation where you see the carotenoids or the anthocyanins. Uh, the anthocyanins actually, if they have alkaline conditions, they'll come through as a blue usually. If they're neutral, they'll be purple. Or, and if the soil or water is slightly acidic, like in this nerve plant, uh, they'll come through as a pink or a red color. And the nerve plant is known as the Phytonia albivianus. I'm really bad at pronouncing that, but the Fetona albivianus, or Viennus, uh, is the name of this plant. Now let's look at a white variety, because it's actually a different form of the same patterning, which is just a natural uh, spot where you don't see the chlorophyll in the plant. And it looks like this. So where it's just white and it doesn't have the genes for that red that humans have bred in, some of these leaves do have the double layering though. You see that? And it's not just the plant veins themselves that are showing where there's no chlorophyll in this nerve plant here. But if you can make it out, there's actually little hairs. Can you see those on the, on the stem here? The little teeny hairs that are all over the plant. Well, on the layer here, we have another chimera. So it's kind of a mix of things going on, but it's a plant where some of the leaves are from some stems from different DNA than from this one, but these leaves are needed to grow the whole system, whereas these leaves with almost no green on them, they have the variegation on the veins, that's the natural adaptive kind, but they also have the visual kind like that Loganondra meboldi does, only it's just the hairs on this one that are crisscrossing in a spider web pattern that allow it to look kind of like a waffle uh, grate or like spider web here. That's those little hairs on the plant, the cilia or trichromes, depending on what part of the plant, if it's a bud or if it's a leaf, uh, that cause these certain limbs of it to have almost no green. And it needs, even though this, this plant naturally, when it looks like this type here, even though it naturally needs very low light, I have to keep this in direct sunlight to make sure that it's doing okay and I have to give it plant food. Now over here we have another kind where the waxy layer again on the plant under the flesh is just showing through and you can still see a pink margin happening there and that's because there are some of the uh, the beta carotene or anthocyanin chemicals present in it but they're just not being selected for. There are versions of this uh, this sedum here or succulent that have it, um, but they're they're completely pink where the red would where the red is starting all the way through the white. And there's other versions that are yellow because the xanthophylls are the more prominent chemicals. But that's all done through human selection. Now the other kinds of of uh, variegation you'll see. You'll see them on these air plants a lot of times. 
And what they'll do is they'll color just the tips. Here you can see where it's grown off. But when I bought this, the tips were dyed and it said that it was a natural form. It wasn't. It was just growing because they had dyed it and it dyed the little hairs on the plant a color. So one type of doing this is through dye. Then another kind that actually was happening here, and that's why I've lined all these up, was I had some moss that had white, which I'd never seen before, and it turned out that it was a virus causing it. So there's some viruses, though, that are benign, and rather than killing the moss and drying it out like this form does, leaves just the yellow uh, xanthophils showing, there are forms in plants that are very rare, and they'll go at auction for hundreds of dollars, those plants, that are caused by viral um, pathogens alone that, that do that. So when we add it all up and you're looking at all the different types of plants and colors and things, pigment in petals and in plants, they evolve all sorts of different ways. Um, when you look at philodendrons or, um, or uh, you know, the other plant is, that's popular with this happening is the uh, monastera uh, plants. They are naturally, they have kind of this same effect here, but it's way more pronounced and therefore called variegated, unlike this one here, uh, not that this is either of those plants, but that happens in the same veining area due to the virus. And that's most common in usually bigger plants that can handle it, but again, it can happen in almost any plant. It's just the virus usually will kill the plant and it has to be a benign enough virus to not kill the plant. Now again, we're back to the kind that's selected for. This is not a chimera, it's not the virus, and it's not the little threads or see-throughness in the plant. It's actually a lack of chlorophyll in a pattern on this uh, snake plant or you know whatever you want to call it. It's, it's what it is, it's a dra drosiana uh, trifasciata. It's also known as, the, I think this is funny, the mother-in-law's tongue plant because it's sharp. Uh, I thought that was cute, but in any case, yeah, it's you know, the snake plant is a more common name and it's just that natural case again. So we have the genetic and natural kind. We have the genetic chimera kind that can be passed down from clippings, but not through flowering and sexual um, propagation. And then we have the hair or uh, the reflective part kind that's going on in here and in the the silver Loganondromy boldi in my aquarium. And lastly, if we had a big plant, we could have uh, the viral kind not sapping the plant so much that its energy is totally gone. And that virus can actually be implanted into other plants and humans are always messing with it. And where it could kill some plants and be a really bad problem, and that's why we have to be careful with what we do when, when fiddling with horticultural things, uh, it also can do nothing, not even cause any of the lightening of the veins. See, here's a plant that doesn't have, the veins are lightened, but this is normal for any plant. So it's not considered variegation. But it, if it hit with that virus, it would go all the way through and you'd see more of a striking difference like these color differences. But remember, this was the chimera difference going on where we have two sets of genetics and one is stripped of a lot of its chlorophyll patterning. So those are the five slash six kinds of different uh, variegated growth that you could encounter. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's show, today's little lesson here. Uh, also know that just because your plant is lighter at the top or something or has some yellow leaves, that's usually a nutrient deficiency. You didn't magically get the mutation that your plant is now some sort of chimera or something. Usually you'll know that from the start. Um, the plant will be half and half of two different things. Uh, and when you see the veins like this, it's probably not a virus in the plant. Uh, if you bought the plant at a, a, a reputable sourced store, uh, they will definitely warn you of that and or you will pay a price tag where you will know that something like that is going on. Now, just to show you here, this water, I need to keep the soil a little alkaline at the base of this Aponegeton 
uh, just because it's got a mutation where instead of being green, like most Aponogetans, like the Madagascar lace plant, this one actually is that purple because of the anthocyanins and because of the pH in the tank. So, all right, guys, if you learn something about how photosynthesis works or how variegation works, love it if you could give me a thumbs up if you made it this far because you probably liked the video. And uh, thank you so much. If you want to support the channel and free education continuing for folks, you can always join uh, Patreon or you can become a member of the channel or drop in on a live chat twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays right now. Uh, where I can answer all your guys' questions and uh, interact with uh, anything that was dropped in the community page on Facebook or on uh, the, the Instagram, or if you need another place to go, of course, the YouTube community page, and uh, all those places add up to uh, a lot of ways to get in contact with me and to get answers from other folks in the hobby. So take care and have a great day. Thanks for watching this episode of The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. <laughs> Bye, guys.